the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Let's honor the Lord together. Stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, it's so good to be in your presence tonight. Thank you for what you've already done in the hearts and lives of people, God. Lord, we praise you and thank you for those unseen things, God, those life-changing moments that just happened right before our very eyes. God, we don't want to stop there. Lord, we want to open up your word and hear from heaven tonight. So Holy Spirit, come be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision and the wisdom and the direction that we need for each and every one of our individual lives. God, as we open up your word, we pray that you would open it up to us and open us up to receive it. May we have eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And may it produce something in each and every one of our lives. Lord, we praise you and we thank you, Father, for how wise you are and how good you are to us, Lord. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. They're our brothers and sisters, Lord, and we love them. At no time do we see ourselves as any better than anyone, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we all say, amen. amen. You may have a seat. Get your Bibles out tonight. Like I had mentioned a moment ago, we're talking about life-changing moments. That's the title of tonight's message is life-changing moments. We've all had some life-changing moments. Throughout our lifetime, we can remember uh, as we look down the road some, some signposts, some monuments that speak of something that happened that literally changed our lives. I remember the day that I gave my heart to Jesus, actually it was in the middle of the night and I went to sleep late that night after I had prayed and given God all my heart and life. And I woke up the next day and bam, immediately it was different. Something had changed, it was like the lights were turned on. The air, for some reason, even through the smog looked sparkling clean, birds were chirping, sun was beaming through the windows. I mean, I I, I must have been walking on air that day. It just seemed like everything was so perfect, everything had changed, everything was different. That was a life-changing moment. Maybe you can remember the day that you got married. You didn't really know what was going on, you had butterflies. That sort of a thing. My wife and I still talk about it to, to this day. If it wasn't for the recording that we listened to afterwards, we still wouldn't know what happened. You know, we were so nervous and, and, and just, you know, there in the presence of God and family and friends and, and staring at each other. I mean, we barely got through the vows. We, we, we didn't really know what was going on. Knees were knocking, all that kind of stuff. But it was a life-changing moment. Some of us can remember the, the birth of our children. I know when those little bundles come into your life, you don't realize it yet. But that's a life-changing moment. And everything in your life is going to get flipped upside down. When you used to sleep, you can't sleep anymore. When you, when, when you, when you finally can sleep, it's daylight hours, all that kind of stuff, and you got to go to work, and things are different. Things change, and the kids grow. And as they grow, your life changes too. My goodness, I've got three children myself, and, and it seems like every time we hit a new season, there's a life change, there's an adjustment, and there's something that goes on. Some changes happen immediately, like we talked about, and some changes happen over time. It's no different with God. You could be having an experience with God, an encounter with God like we had tonight, and bang, everything in an instant changes. Sometimes all it takes is one word from God, and your whole world is flipped upside down. When you think about it, this is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. God can speak, and a planet exists. How much more when he says something into our life or, or, or something happens with God, can it just change everything about our life? Think about the creative power that God has, and that power is in his word. And as God speaks his word into your life, it has the power to change everything. But we also see in the word of God that the, the word is likened unto a seed, small and insignificant like we talked about this morning, hidden, hidden in the ground. It's buried, and Jesus said it. Unless it falls to the ground and dies. See, it's got to be covered up. It's got to be hidden. There has to be something that takes place. And there in the secret place, there in the unseen, something starts to happen. Something starts to change. God now brings a resurrection. Now that thing that fell to the ground and died is the very thing that produces life. Sometimes we wonder, you know, we we go to church and we hear the word or, or maybe we're reading or we're praying or something like that. And we know something went in, but we're wondering, where is it? And there's a parable that talks about the seed that's sown, and while the farmer goes to sleep, things happen. See, sometimes we're unaware. 
as these life-changing moments happen of what's really taking place, of what's really going on. And so tonight I want to talk to you about some of this as we take a look at what's going on, what happens in that secret place, what happens in that, that, that unseen place. Yes, sometimes right then, right there, bang, but sometimes it happens over time. Either way, be encouraged that God has life-changing moments ahead of you. That tonight is a life-changing moment. That as you leave this place, even though you may look the same, smell the same, something happened in your life. Why? Because you had an encounter with God. Why? Because you were in the presence of God. Why? Because you got a hold of the Word of God. And something may change tonight or something may change over time, but it doesn't matter because it's a life-changing moment. In fact, every day we have these opportunities. Every day we have an encounter with God. When you wake up and you look around, you know, we, here we are in San Bernardino, and we look around ourselves, we see the mountains, we see the trees. Did you know that the Bible says that all creation speaks of the glory of God? That the heavens declare his glory. My goodness. Look up in the, in the clouds and in the sky, see the sun, see the moon, see the stars. All of it is singing praises to God. All of it is declaring the glory of God, and that can be a life-changing moment when you take a moment and listen. When we look at one another and when we see that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, when we see humanity, sometimes all it takes is the compassion of God to light up your life and all of a sudden you start to see someone else through the eyes of God and now all of a sudden your life is changed. I know I've had some life-changing moments on the mission field, seeing the world, seeing the loss. I've had life-changing moments here in San Bernardino, seeing people line up for food, seeing our outreaches, seeing people in the park that would have had backpacks otherwise. See, what, what happened? What happened was God was saying, I want you to look here. I want you to see this. I want you to have the compassion. Feel something here, child. That's a life-changing moment. Every day, we have an opportunity. When you go on the job and you start to hear your coworkers talking and you, you hear what's going on in their life and you see their frailty and their depravity. See, your heart can be turned to have a compassion for the lost. And that can be a life-changing moment. Each and every day, we... We can have these moments. Matthew chapter 6, if you turn there with me, Matthew, Matthew chapter number 6. just want to mention this to you. Pastor Luke used this in a message a while ago. And I want to show you, talking about that hidden, unseen thing that happens on the inside. Sometimes we look right over it. Sometimes we're unaware. Sometimes we think of it as insignificant. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 6 says this. It says, but you, when you pray... Go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. Notice that God isn't parading himself out in the open. We can't say, oh, go here, go there, you know, he's, he's over there, go talk to him. No, he's invisible, and he's in the secret place. And look at this, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. That means that what happens in your private life will be paraded in public. That means that those life-changing moments with God, whether it's in your prayer closet, whether it's in church, whether it's in the car on the way to work, whether it's in the shower when you're getting ready for your day, whether it's in your quiet time when you sit down to read the Bible and pray, whatever it is, whatever that moment is in that secret place, whatever's taking place in your private life with God, in those life-changing moments, the things that happen at this altar tonight, listen to me, church, they will be paraded out in the open. That's why the Bible so often speaks of what goes on. You know, it talks about ministers. Ministers' lives are in a fishbowl. Everybody's watching. And, and the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, if there's somebody who desires to be a minister, he better watch his private life at home. Why? Because what happens at home will be expressed in public. What's going on in the secret place is going to be paraded out in the open. Jesus said the things that you whisper in the innermost rooms are going to be shouted from the rooftops. What does that mean? That means that you and I need to be wise enough to, to recognize and to realize those things that are happening. Even though it may take time, even though it may be unforeseen, or maybe it happened just like that, it's going to be declared. It's going to be shown to be what it is. So tonight I want to take a look at some life-changing moments that we can experience in our lives, that we see from the Word of God individuals who experience these life-changing moments as well. And I believe that as we take a look at these things and, and we apply them to our lives, that we're going to see those things manifest out in the open. Those things are going to appear in our lives. Some of you guys need these things that we're talking about. Listen, I need these things we're talking about. Are you hearing me tonight? Praise God. A couple of things that we're going to take a look at tonight that I believe are going to bless you. First one is favor. 
favor. Life-changing moments. First thing is favor. One moment of the favor of God can change your life forever. Just one little instant of the favor of God will make you a different person. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, let's take a look at it in the Word. Turn with me into the Old Testament to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter number 1. In Nehemiah chapter number 1, we're going to take a look at a couple of verses. It's before the Psalms, before Job, before Esther. You'll find Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter number 1. Let me set the stage for you. The nation of Israel has been taken captive. The kingdom has been besieged, and they have been uprooted and planted in another nation. Now, these people have been taken captive, and there is a remnant still living in Israel. That was left by the occupying army. And they let them stay there, but they took most of the cream of the crop, the nobles, the the wealthy, all that kind of stuff, the educated. They took them, and they incorporated them into their nation. And so here we find a man who is in that place. He was the cupbearer for the king. His name is Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the cupbearer. What does that mean? That means that he is the one who stands in the presence of the king And he holds the cup of the king, and he drinks the wine before the king drinks it. Why? To make sure that it's not poisoned. Because one of the king's enemies may come along, or one of the people who's trying to usurp the throne may come along, and may try and poison his drink and give it to the king. So what he does is he has somebody who's going to stand there and present him with the cup, and before he drinks it, the cupbearer will take a drink and make sure that nothing's wrong. Then after everything's okay, he hands the king his cup. Now this cupbearer was privy to a lot of privileged time in the presence of the king. You think about it, anytime the king was going to sit down to eat or drink, here's the cupbearer. Anytime the king just wanted to have a drink to relax, here's the cupbearer. So if the king's got a stressful meeting and and he says, man, I'm I'm parched, I need a drink, send for the cupbearer. Here comes the cupbearer, probably in private meetings, probably in celebrations, probably in personal family moments, different things. So this guy would have been near and dear to the king. With that in mind, we find that Nehemiah has some friends and relatives, some other Israelites come, and they, he asks them about what's going on back in Jerusalem. They give him a report that the wall is broken down, has been burned with fire, and he just has heartbreak. His heart aches for Jerusalem. He knows what it means to God, and he knows what it means to the people. Therefore, he goes before the Lord in prayer, and he prays this amazing prayer. You can read it there in Nehemiah chapter number 1. And as he's praying before God, he's just speaking to God, and he's confessing the sin of his people and of himself, and and he's humbling himself before God. And in Nehemiah chapter number 1, verse number 11, he says these words. Take a look at it with me. Nehemiah chapter number 1, verse number 11, he says, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. That's quite a statement right there. Look at what it says. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, And grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, who is this man that he's talking about? He's talking about the king. And he says, for I was the king's cupbearer. So he says, God, I need to prosper. I need to do something about this, Lord. And I desire to fear your name, God. I don't want to repeat the mistakes of my fathers in not fearing you. So we desire, Lord, to fear your name. So God, prosper me so that I can go back and build the walls of Jerusalem once again and give me Mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Now he goes in before the king. You know, he's kind of, this thing is still weighty on his heart. And he goes in before the king with a sad countenance. And he presents the king the cup with a sad countenance. Now that could have been Nehemiah's end right at that moment. Why? Because you think about it for a second. If Nehemiah was privy to all this privileged information, it was basically part of the family, right? He was brought in on everything. Here he is. Anytime the king's going to take a drink, here's Nehemiah. And he's... Okay, it's good, king. Go ahead and drink, right? Now, if he's sad in the presence of the king, that may mean that he knows of a plot. That may mean that he's sad that the king's going to die as he presents him this cup. So here he is with his life on the line presenting this to the king. But he said, Lord, I need mercy in the sight of this man. I need to prosper, but I need mercy in the sight of this man. Now, take a look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse number 4. The king looks at him, he says, my goodness, this is nothing but sadness of heart. What's going on? 
So Nehemiah chapter 2, verse number 4, he says, Then the king said to me, What do you request? See, he had told him, uh, King, how can I be happy when the walls are broken down? King, how can I be happy when my people are scattered? How can I be happy when this place lies in ruin? So the king says, What do you request? That right there shows me that he had the favor of God on his life and he had mercy that he had prayed for. Let's read on. Look at what it says. He says, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Now we read something like that and normally we would think that he prayed this same sort of prayer that he just prayed in chapter one. But Nehemiah is standing there staring at the king the king has just asked him a question. And Nehemiah looks at him and he says, so what do you request? Nehemiah didn't have time to say, hold on, king. Lord, I ask you that you would give. No, he didn't have time to do that. So what does he do? He says, God, you just take control here. God, just give me the favor that I need. Quick prayer. Quick prayer on the inside. Lord, help that could have been all that he prayed. I don't know. It, the Bible doesn't record. It just says he prayed. So what did he do? He reconnected with God. See, he wasn't looking to this man for favor. He wasn't looking to this man for his provision. He wasn't looking to this man for what he needed. No, he knew where the power source was. And so he prays at that moment to the God of heaven. Why? Because this man has the ability to bring into Nehemiah's life the things here on the earth that he needs. But he knew he couldn't get them without God putting favor on his life. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Now, in the next couple of verses, Nehemiah asked the king for a leave of absence. Basically, if you, if you boil it all down, he asked him, I need a leave of absence. I need to go. I need to build. He says, how long do you want? When you coming back? He liked them so much, he wanted them back. And so he goes on and he says, not only that, he says, I need some letters to be given to me so that I can travel throughout the land. And so any of the governors of the provinces, when I come across them, they won't kill me for trying to rebuild. But I'll have a letter from you, king, that says, I'm okay. I can do this. See, this is the king's signature here. And therefore, you've got to let me pass through to get back to Jerusalem because we're going to rebuild Jerusalem. And you can't stop me because I've got the king backing me. Then what else does he do? He goes a little bit further and a little bit bolder, and he says, and king, not only that, but king, I need some timber. Why? Because I've got to rebuild these walls. I've got to rebuild some houses. I've got to have a place to stay. I, 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 I need some timber, king. So can you give me the leave of absence with pay? Can you give me the, hello, can you give me the letters that I need to go and talk to these people so that they don't try and stop me? And can you also give me the provisions that I have need of? Now, let's take a look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse number 8. He's talking about the letter that he needs, the timber that he needs. And look at the, the end of the verse, if we could put that. Look at this. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse number 8. Let's put up part B. Nehemiah chapter 2, 8, part B. Look at what it says. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. What does that mean? That means that he may have been asking an earthly king for all these things, but it was the hand of God that was upon him that brought the favor that he needed in order to get those things. And the cupbearer at that moment became the leader in Jerusalem. He became the mayor of Jerusalem, basically. He was the manager. He was the one that was out there. He was the one. He was the construction foreman. He, he was the leader. He was telling people, this is what you, you get over here. You build this. He, in an instant, in a life-changing moment, because of the favor of God, had everything turned around in his life. That thing that was a heartache now was a heart cry. It was a passion. He went out there and he accomplished that which he went forth to do. They completed the wall. All because he had the favor, the hand of God. He had the backing of God. Listen, when those guys, those governors came back and they came against him, he never brought up the letters from the natural king and said, hey, look at king's signature, you can't do anything. No, he didn't do that. He said, listen, the work's too much and God's too good. I can't deal with this foolishness right now. And he put it back in God's hands. Why? Because he wasn't worried about an earthly king's signature. He was worried about the king of glory and the passion and the position and the change that was on his life. And so he had a job to do when he went after it. Life-changing moments. Amazing thing is that we know that today 
that we are not just in the favor of God, we are highly favored of God. Are you listening? Some of you thought God was mad at you, came in here tonight and thought, you know what, God probably thinks I'm the lowest of the low. I'm not the bottom of the totem pole. I'm the base of the totem pole. I'm under the ground. I I mean, it, it couldn't get any worse. I've hit rock bottom. Listen, the good thing about hitting rock bottom is the only way to go is up. And so God is telling you tonight, listen, he knows where you've been. He knows what you've done. It's time to come home. It's time to repent and turn back to him. It's time for you to not only receive salvation or repentance or whatever that is in your life, but now it's time for you to receive the favor of God. God wants to show you that you are so favored. Let's take a look at it in the Christmas story, Luke chapter 1. We've heard this year after year in Luke chapter number 1. For some of you who've heard this, It's good to be reminded, some of us, this is our first time hearing this, so come on. Listen up to what God is saying, Luke chapter number one. Sometimes we look at other people and we say, well, other people have favor. I don't have favor. Other people have got it. I don't know why God blesses someone and doesn't bless me. Well, God must be mad at me. Maybe God's ignoring me. Maybe God just doesn't come down my street. Maybe God skipped San Bernardino in his blessings. Listen, God is not Santa Claus. God is God. And God loves you. And God favors you. God highly favors you. See, we take a look at Mary, and there are people who put Mary on such a pedestal. Take a look at why. We can understand why. She was a devout woman. She loved the Lord. She was righteous before God. She received Jesus Christ on the inside of her and birthed the Messiah into the earth. My goodness. Look at what the angel says to her. Luke chapter 1, verse number 28. Luke chapter 1, verse 28 says this. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. Everybody say highly favored. favored. Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. My goodness, we say, of course she was. Here she was about ready to receive the Messiah on the inside of her. But that word, highly favored one, is found only two times in the New Testament. Two times. One here with Mary talking about Mary, you are the highly favored one, you're about to receive the king, but did you know that also, that that word highly favored one is found somewhere else in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 6, turn there with me, Ephesians chapter number 1, talking about how we are adopted as sons By Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 6. Look at this. To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us. Everybody say, he made me. me. Oh, come on. That's only the front rows. Everybody say, he made me. me. See, he didn't just make Mary. He didn't just make Jesus. He made you, and he made me. Look at this. To the praise of his glory, of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. That word accepted there means highly favored. Where? In the beloved. That means that when we receive Jesus Christ on the inside of us, just like Mary received Jesus Christ on the inside of her, now you and I, similarly, we receive Jesus Christ to live in our hearts, and now we are made accepted in the beloved. That means that we are highly favored of the Lord. And like we're saying tonight, the favor of the Lord is a life-changing moment in your life. When you realize that you have the favor of God on your life. Why? Because Jesus lives on the inside of you. Why? Because you are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because, yeah, you may have been a screw-up and a mess-up, but now you are a saint of Almighty God. You're getting your life cleaned up. You're learning how to do this. You're walking the walk. You're talking the talk. You are wall-to-wall Holy Spirit on the inside now, and God looks at you, and no longer does he see that old sinner you. No, now he sees Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now he says, there is my son living his life in and through that vessel. And you have the favor of the Lord upon you. What is it that you're trying to do, church? Where is it that you're trying to go? What do you need in life? Don't look to man. Don't look to earthly kings. Yes, they may have something you need, but you look to God for your provision. You look to God for that favor. You look to God for that blessing, and God will bring it to you and get the will of God through you. Are you listening tonight? Life-changing moments. First one is the favor. Second one is heart desires heart desires say what does that mean heart desires can change your life 
See, when we have a desire so great that we don't get distracted, we don't go after anything else, it changes our life. It changes our life. Why? Because where our attention used to be somewhere else, now it's here. This is my heart desire. Where I used to be distracted, now I'm focused. Where I used to spend and give energy and effort into other things, now this is my heart desire. This is the one thing. This is what's important. And your heart desire can change your life. Your heart desire can change your life. See, sometimes we, we say, Pastor, I, I don't want to have a heart desire because I used to have something I wanted and, and I brought it before God and I got disappointed. And so I'm afraid to dream. I, I'm afraid to, 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 to think about things that could be because you know what? My hope was deferred. And the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. But listen, we don't hope as the world hopes, the Bible says. The Bible says now that we have Jesus Christ on the inside of us, the hope of glory. The Bible says that even though we may not see the promise in this life, that we look past that and we look forward to Jesus. And it doesn't matter what happens in this life. We've got our eyes fixed on Jesus. And so therefore, when we get our eyes fixed on Jesus and we start to dream about Jesus and we start to see Jesus and we start to dream the God dream and we get that God desire on the inside of us, now it's no longer me, but it's Christ in me and Christ living his life through me. And now God can use me as a vessel to pour out his plan on the earth. God has desires and plans for your life, plans of good. And as we reconnect our life with him and as we align our life with him and our thoughts and our, and our dreams, and now all of a sudden, instead of dreaming about ourselves and glorifying ourselves and our fame, our fortune, our wealth, now we start to think kingdom thoughts and we start to go down kingdom paths. And in our dreaming, now all of a sudden, it's no longer our dreams. It's his dreams. You're there in Ephesians. Turn back with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, we see a guy who had a dream. Him and his wife, well advanced in years. The old King James says it kind of funny. He says they were stricken with age. Luke chapter 1, a guy by the name of Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth. They had a dream. They had a desire. And the desire that they had didn't come out of their heart. Little did they know, after all those years of desiring it, that it was a God dream, that God had placed it in their hearts. Why? Because God knew that he needed someone to go before the face of his Messiah. God knew that there needed to be a prophet that would come into the land. God knew that there had to be that voice of one crying in the wilderness. And in order to get him there, he was going to use two very special people who were righteous before God, blameless before God, loved God. They focused on God. And yet, there was something that they wanted in their life, and that was a child. And so, this man, Zacharias, was a priest, and it, it, the lot fell to him to go in during the hour of prayer, the hour of incense, and to burn incense before the Lord. And so, here he is. He's ministering. He's doing his duty, basically. But everybody else outside, the Bible says, is praying while he's inside doing his duty. But you know what? He had a desire on the inside of his heart. He had something that he was focused on, something that he wanted from God. And we look at it in... Luke chapter 1, verse number 13, it says these words. Luke chapter 1, verse 13, there was an angel. Zacharias was troubled, verse 13, but the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Wow. See, there was a desire that he wanted. He wanted a son. He had asked God for a son, and now here he is in the temple. Here he is burning incense on the altar at the hour of prayer and and there he is and he's doing his ministry and i know if i was in there i would have been probably so focused on the ministry side of it so focused on make sure that you burn this incense the right way they've got that rope tied around your leg you know just in case god gets mad at you they might have to pull you out because you died that sort of a thing. You know, you got the bells attached to the bottom of the robe and, and that sort of a thing. And the, all those images would be going through my head and, and I would have been just going through a religious ceremony instead of praying. Yet here Zacharias is. He's a righteous and just man before God. And yeah, he's doing his ministry, but there's something on the inside of him. There's a desire. And as he goes before God, that heart's desire is translated into a prayer that God hears and God grants. C.S. Lewis said, when we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, 
fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a vacation at the beach. We are far too easily pleased. Church, God is asking us to get the God dream on the inside, to get a God desire on the inside, to dream for the impossible and believe God for it. Why? Because God is a God of the impossible. Why? Because nothing is impossible to God. Why? Because all things are possible to him that believes. But we got to get it on the inside of us. we got to see it here, and we got to bring it to God, and God will bring it to pass. Psalm 37, verse 4, you can just mark that down. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. He shall give you the desires of your heart. Billy Graham said, delighting in the Lord alters the desires. See, when you are so focused on God, when you're so in love with Jesus, and when that is your fixed focus, when that is your aim, your goal in life, yes, you're still going to go and pay the bills, go to work every day. Yes, you're still going to take care of the kids and the house. Yes, you're still going to have to do some things like recreation, get your mind off stuff every now and then, and those sorts of things. Yes, those are all important elements of our life. But yet God is saying, you're one goal, you're one focus, don't get religious, don't let it be a system or a ceremony or a ritual. Get your desire on me, child, and as you focus on me, the desires on the inside of you will start to change and start to adjust, and as you delight yourself in the Lord, he shall give you the desires of your heart. He's going to bring it to pass. Augustine in the book, The Confessions of St. Augustine, said, sin comes when we take a perfectly natural desire or longing or ambition and try desperately to fulfill it without God. Not only is it sin, it's a per perverse distortion of the image of the creator in us. See, God wants to create things inside but when we try and do it on our own, when we try and do it in our power, try and do it in our way, it starts to pervert it, starts to get off track. He says, all these good things and all our security are rightly found only and completely in him. Heart's desires, church. Your one heart's desire. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, Lord. That should be our desire. That should be our passion, our one goal in life. Life-changing moments. First one is favor. Second one is heart desires. Last one for tonight. You guys still okay? All right, praise the Lord. Last one for tonight is honor. Honor. You say, well, wait a second, Pastor. We were talking about favor. Now we're talking about honor. What's the difference there? The difference is this. Favor means that there is approval. There is that acceptance. You have that, that freedom now. You can go into the presence of God. God, you're his child. So what, what does that mean? That means God favors you. Yeah, you can come in. Yeah, you can have it. Why? Because you're my child. You've got the favor on you. Honor is different. Honor is different in the sense that if you look up the original word, it talks about weight being added to something. It talks about glory, actually. That word glory, if you've ever heard the weight of glory, it's, it's an honor. See, there's sometimes that, that men can honor you, and it adds weight to you. In other words, there are people in our society that we know have received honors, and because they have received honors, when they speak, people listen. When they say things, people do them. And why? Because they are honored among men. And you and I, it can be a life-changing moment when we realize that honor from men doesn't mean a thing, but the honor that comes from the Lord means everything. God said, those whom honor me, well, I will honor. See, the more value, the more weight that you place on the things of God, now God will value and place weight on the things in your life. I know it's quiet because the wheels are turning right now. That's okay. But the more you give attention and interest and focus and passion into the things of God, the more God is going to give attention and interest and focus and passion into the things of your life. How do I know that? Because God can't go back on his word. And the Bible says that give and it shall be given to you, right? Whatever measure you use will be measured back to you. So that means however much you give to God, God will give back to you. In other words, if I use a teeny little, teeny tiny little spoon and I say, God, here it is, God's going to take out his teeny tiny little spoon and he's going to say, here, you go back. But when I take out the shovel, God takes out his shovel. And when I break out the bucket, God breaks out his bucket. 
And when I break out the dump truck, God breaks out his dump truck. And it's a pretty fun game that we've been playing all our lives, and God still is winning. Are you listening? Are you here tonight? And when we start to honor God and honor the things of God, now all of a sudden God starts to honor us. Look at Nehemiah, right? He said, well, I desire to fear your name. I want to place weight and value on you, God. All of a sudden he's got favor on his life. All of a sudden he's got the accomplishments of what he wanted to do. Why? Because God looked into his life and said, oh, you're honoring me? Well, I'm going to honor you. You got involved in what I say. I'm going to get involved in what you're doing, right? Why? Because his heart and desire lined up with the things of God. And he was honored. Nehemiah was honored. He had weight to him. When he spoke, things happened. People listened to him. Why? Because he was honored by God. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 18 says, Whoever keeps the fig tree will eat its fruit. So he who waits on his master will be honored. Think about that for a second. Some of you guys probably have fruit trees at your home. And as you tend those fruit trees, you will eat of its fruit. In other words, the interest and the attention that you give to those trees will produce fruit into your life. But if you never trimmed the tree, if you never went out there and gave it water, if you never went out there and, you know, got rid of the bugs and, and the beetles and all that kind of stuff that could just destroy the tree, if you never went and gathered the fruit, then you would never reap the benefit of having that tree. In the same way, it says, so he who waits on his master will be honored. In other words, the servant that does a good job, that master is going to like that servant and give him honor, more weight will be added to that servant. That's why Nehemiah had such favor with his king. Why? Because he did a good job as a cupbearer. Same way, you, you may have been working on a job and you've done the best job. I remember I was working at Tire and Lube Express. Come on, somebody. There when I was working at Tire and Lube Express, the only two Christian guys was me and another guy named Miguel. Me and Miguel, man, it was every day when we'd show up to work. Hey, brother, how you doing, man? Good to see you, you know, this and that. And how's the kids, you know? And he'd tell me how his family was. And at that time, I, I was just getting going, you know? So it wasn't even married, nothing. How you doing? I'm good, you know, still going to college. Yeah, things, things are good, doing this and that. And so we get to work, right? All the other guys are fooling around, whistling at the girls, doing all this stuff. And we had our heads down, our elbows up in, 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 in the grease and the hot oil. You know, I, I left that place sometimes. My hair was slicked back. Why? Because I had just got a, 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 a grease job from the car. You know, you pop that nut off and it gets all over you. Soaked down to your skivvies. I mean, come on. And yet... We did such a good job that when I finally said, hey, I'm moving on and, and I'm quitting this job, the boss started to say, well, wait, wait, can't, can't we work this out? Where are you going? You can't go. No, I'm going. No, you can't go. Well, I'm going and, and, and I'm going to be out of the country for a couple of months. He says, well, when you come back, come back here and I'll give you your job back. I said, no, I don't want this job back. I'm done being a grease monkey. And he said, hey, can I talk you out of that? Can I talk you? Come on, man. I want you. Why? Because... We just had our nose to the grindstone. Why? Because we did the best job we could, and now we were honored. See, when you give interest and attention to the things of God, hello? When you give interest and attention to the things of God, now all of a sudden God says, okay, you've got my attention. Okay, you're going to be honored. Why? Because you've done well. You see that all throughout the Bible. You see that in the parables. Let's take a look at a guy in the Old Testament, First Chronicles chapter 4. Turn back with me to Old Testament, 1 Chronicles. We'll, we'll end with this. 1 Chronicles chapter number 4. Some of you may have been reading through the Bible and got to 1 Chronicles chapter number 4 and thought, why did God keep this in the Bible? 1 Chronicles chapter number 4 is talking about the family of Judah and it's talking about all the kids that... Judah had, and then it goes on to talk about their kids, and then it talks about their kids' kids, and their kids after them, and then their kids, and so-and-so begot so-and-so, and so-and-so begot so-and-so, and, and, and the sons of this person were these people, and it goes on, it just keeps going on. Right in the middle of this genealogy, right in the middle of this lineage, God takes a break, and God talks about somebody, and God honors this person. Let's read it together, First Chronicles chapter number 4, verse number 9 and 10. It says, now Jabez, now hold on a second, wasn't even named as the son of anybody, wasn't named as anybody else. God just stops and it says, hold on, 
I was going to mention this guy, but I can't just skip over him. I've got to honor him. I've got to take some time with this guy. Take a look at what it says. Now, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. What does that mean? God thought so much of this guy, Jabez, that he took some time out. He just gave the brother a little honorable mention. But now Jabez, he's got to take some time with this guy. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. Now, how would you like to be called pain? Literally translated, sorrow. Hey, sorrow, can you bring me some milk from the fridge? Right? Kind of sounds like a bad joke that you were the punchline of. And some of you may be feeling like a Jabez tonight. All my life, all I've done is screw up. All my life, all I've done is bring other people pain. I came to church because I'm hopeless, and, I, and I, maybe God could do something in my life. Listen, when you give interest and attention into the things of God, now God will turn around and honor you. God will satisfy you with long life, the Bible says. God will give interest and attention into your life. And then it won't be Jabez, it'll be your name there. God says, verse number 10, and Jabez called on the God of Israel. See, he gave some interest. He gave some attention. He gave some time. He called on the God of Israel saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed. See, we hear prayers like that and we say, my goodness, this guy is crazy. Who prays that God would bless them? He should be unselfish and pray other people get blessed. And yet God's taking time out for this guy. Why? Because God saw something in him. Because God saw that time. God saw that attention. Saw that Jabez placed a weight on God. Let's read on. Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. He's still asking for stuff for himself. Enlarge my territory. God, I want more. More space, more room, more land. That your hand would be with me. Now remember, the hand of God was with Nehemiah, and that was the favor of God that blessed him. That your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil. Look at what he ends his prayer with, that I may not cause pain. In other words, all of his life he'd been called sorrow. All of his life he'd been called pain. All of his life he was reminded that at his beginnings that he had caused someone else grief and sorrow. And he says, now Lord, keep me from evil. And the old King James says that it may not grieve me. New King James says that, that I may not cause pain. In other words, he's saying I don't want my legacy to be my name's sake. I want my legacy to be what you have to say about me. Take a look at the rest of the verse. It says, so God granted him what he requested. We would have said, God, why did you grant that? He was asking for all sorts of stuff for himself. So selfish. I can't believe that. And yet, look at where the heart is. Look at where the weight is. God, I don't want to cause pain. God, I don't want to cause grief. I don't want to cause sorrow. Keep me from evil. That I may not cause pain. What's he saying? He says, God, if I'm not walking in an evil way, that's your righteous way. God, that's your will. That's your way. And God, as I do that, Lord, I know that you can trust me with greater things in large territory. God, I know that you can bless me indeed. I know, God, that your hand would be with me, God. And God looks at that request and says, you took time. You put your interest. You put your attention. You put your heartfelt desire. Now, not only the favor of God, the hand of God is upon you. Now, you are honored. God took some time out to talk to us about this man, Jabez. Tonight, life-changing moments. Things that maybe happen overnight. Things that may look insignificant and take time, either way, it's going to change your life. I believe that as you guys go from this place, you're going to realize the word of the Lord that went in. Every time you go to church, be led of the Spirit of God, like we heard this morning, and, and, and allow the word of God to change you. Have an encounter. Have a life-changing moment with God. What did we learn tonight? Life-changing moments, favor. Favor. God has made you accepted in the beloved. You have the favor of God upon you. Second thing tonight that we learned, life-changing moment, is heart desires. When your desires line up with his desires, and now all of a sudden God can get to you and through you the will and the plan of God on the earth. And finally, third life-changing moment is honor. When God honors you, it changes your life. Now it adds weight to your life, and that makes all the difference. If you got something from God tonight, come on, give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah to talk to some of you guys that left. If you can hear the sound of my voice in the foyer, I want to talk to you. I want to make sure that if you left this place, that you wouldn't end up in hell. 
So if you can hear my voice out there in the foyer, back in the bathrooms or out there in the breezeways, and you're walking towards your car, please stop for a moment and either come back in or listen up where you're at. Take a seat on one of the benches out there. I also want to talk to those of you that are inside of the sanctuary as well. You guys didn't leave. Thank you for staying put. I want to make sure that your heart is right with God before you leave this place. And I believe that God is giving me an urgency right now. Because we are not guaranteed tomorrow. Jesus could come. He could come tonight. Who knows? Or Jesus could not come in our lifetime. We don't know. But you know, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Working with the young adults ministry here at The Rock for seven years, there were plenty of young adults that we buried during that time. Things can happen in a moment. And so this is a very serious time, and I want you guys to give me a couple more minutes of your attention and really listen in. Give God a couple more minutes. I want to make sure that if you left this place and this was your last day on the earth, you closed your eyes on earth and opened your eyes in eternity, that you would end up in heaven and not in hell. Now, how do we do that? Sometimes people hear me say hell, and they say, well, I don't believe in hell. You know, I, I think that that's just, you know, one of those boogeyman stories that was made up by well-meaning people to keep people in line. But did you know that all throughout the Bible it talks about hell? In the Old and New Testament, Jesus even talked about hell. That means it's a very real place. And you're not going to avoid hell just by denying its existence. That's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. Go out on the slow lane of the freeway, you'll meet one face-to-face -face eventually. So you can't just deny hell's existence and think that it's going to go away. Hell was never made for you and I. It was made for the devil and his angels who rebel. And so this is a very serious time, and I ask, please don't get up. Please don't walk around during this time because you can distract others that God is speaking to. Sometimes people say, well, I believe that all roads lead to heaven, and I believe I'm going to get there whatever way I want. You get there your way, I'll get there my way. We'll all get there the same. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say all roads lead to heaven or just do whatever you want and you get to go there? I mean, think about it. God sends his son Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross, goes through the agony. crucified and after that he's going to let it be whoever wants to do whatever they want and they get to go to heaven you get there your way I'll get there my way listen can't get there your way can't get there my way can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way we've got to get there the Bible's way Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life and no man goes to the father except by me what does that mean that means it's God's heaven you're only going to get there God's way Sometimes people say, but I was raised in church. My parents told me you were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? Went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. And you were born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible just say that you attend church, be raised in church as a child, parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible say that you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven. And again, nowhere in the Bible say that you're born in America or that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people say, yeah, but not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am in church tonight, sitting in front of you, and I consider myself to be a Christian. That's great. I'm glad you're here, but show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's like saying you can go lay down in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. Not going to work. Nowhere in the Bible say sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Now, you might be thinking, but pastor, I got involved in my last church. I helped out. I sang in the choir for a number of years. Carried the pastor's Bible. Made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I, I even taught in the Bible classes and got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where your church involvement gets you into heaven. You help out, sing in the choir, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. Teaching the Bible classes. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does say God is waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. That's how you think you're going to get to go to heaven. Come on, let's love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Tonight, I love you enough and respect you enough and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Come on. Now, sometimes people say, but pastor, I know God. I know about Jesus. Celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. Know about Easter and the resurrection. Could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. That's great. I'm glad you can do that. But could you just show that to me in the Bible? 
or you have head knowledge about who Jesus is, knowing who Jesus is, celebrating a holiday, quoting some scripture that that makes you right with God headed for heaven. Listen, everybody in America knows who Jesus is, but not everybody in America is a Christian headed for heaven. You know, if you read your Bible, the Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They know who he is. They know about the resurrection. That doesn't qualify them for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself knows who Jesus is and quotes scriptures in the Bible. Wow. And yet that doesn't make him a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a moment. Look up here. It's not about what you have in your head. Some mental ascent towards God that gets you right with God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is. But rather, this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God's looking for a heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They raked it to the coals. They made it out to be something that it's not. It's not about what society says or movies or Hollywood or television, books or the internet. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, like I said, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. What does it mean? It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 3. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, what does lukewarm mean? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, time out. If I raise my hand and you point and count, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Get over it. Why? Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell? Come on. Come on. You can get right with God in this safe and friendly place tonight. No one's judging you. No one's criticizing you. No one's condemning you or laughing at you. We're all excited for you. We want you to do this. And truth be told, we've all done this at one point or another in some way or another. Tonight is your night of salvation. This is your life-changing moment with God. Come on, don't miss it. You've missed enough opportunities in your life. This is your time. This is your moment. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to that, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart in your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? You're lukewarm. You know, that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or you just hear the sound of my voice there in the foyer or out there in the breezeways. You can raise your hand and then come in and tell an usher right afterwards. They'll let you into the church service. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Raise them up high. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Five wise people. Six got you up top. Anybody else? Seven, eight. Thank you. Nine. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? There's nine wise people already. Where you got number 10? Number 10, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Go for it. Go for it. Got you right there. Number 10, number 11, and number 12. Got you. You can put your hand down. Thank you. 12. There's a dozen wise people. We got number 13, number 14, number 15. Come on. Come on. You were waiting. You were wondering if anybody was going to do this, and you didn't want to look foolish. Thank you. Thank you, number 13. Come on, number 14. Come on, you know that's you. You were, you were just holding back to see what happened. Yeah, you've seen it. Didn't embarrass them. Won't embarrass you. Maybe your heart's pounding out of your chest right now. You're wondering, is he talking to me? God just told on you. Talking to you. Come on. If that's you, you haven't yet. Said yes to Jesus. Come on, if that's you, just lift your hand up. Anybody else real quick? Got 13 wise people already. A baker's dozen. Come on, where where are the rest of you guys at? Anybody else? Real quick. Real quick. Come on. Pop it up. This is the last call. 
Don't miss this opportunity. This is your life-changing moment. Anybody else? Anybody else just pop it up? Pop it up. Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for 13 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. Maybe the other ones are out there in the foyer. Wherever you're at, if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, it's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go hold over your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that until we get you down here. If you're sitting next to somebody, raise your hand, nudge them and say, hey, friend, I'll go with you. Come on. So if that's you, you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front. You come right now. Come on. Let's let them come forward right now. You come. Come on, come on, come on. If that's you, you need to come. Come on, come on, come on. Wherever you're at, if you need to come, come on down. If you need to come from the family rooms, you're welcome. Bring your kids at this time. They're welcome. Come on. If your child raise their hand, say, come on, let's go. They'll remember this. Anybody else if you need to come, come on down. Come on down. you guys. Put a smile on your face. It's not a bad thing. Okay, this is a good thing. You haven't come to a funeral. You came to a birthday celebration. It's your birthday. You're going to be born again, brand new, on the inside. And God's got a life change ahead of you. It's going to be tough. I'll let you know that in advance. Okay? It's not easy, but it's the best decision of your entire life. Most of the good things that you do in life are going to be hard. Okay? But as that comes out of a passionate desire, look at you guys. You're so passionate, so excited that you would actually walk down. That's a bold, brave move, and I commend you tonight. Now listen, right over here is my friend, Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is like the best guy in the place, all right? He's a really cool guy. Nothing weird is going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, you already got past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to see tonight. It's cool from here on out, okay? Pastor Dave's going to do three things. I'll let you know what they are in advance so that you're not wondering. First thing he's going to do is pray with you. He'll lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff. Everybody loves free stuff. We love giving away free stuff. Already, that's a good relationship, okay? So he's going to give you some little booklets that our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Easy reading, okay? Easy steps to a successful future with God, all right? Last thing he's going to do, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church, okay? We call them spiritual personal trainers. Now, you heard of a physical trainer that helps you get buff just like me? <laughs> Why is everybody laughing? spiritual personal trainer will help you to do that spiritually. Basically, they'll come alongside you for a couple of weeks, teach you some things out of the Bible that'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord so you don't go back to serve the devil, that you go on with God. Now listen, I'm going to make a promise to you guys. You guys will give us one year here at The Rock. One year. At the end of that year, as you experience those life-changing moments, the favor of God, the heart desires changing into God's desires, and, and, and the honor that God places on your life as you honor Him. I guarantee you, at the end of that year and for the rest of your life, you're going to look back and say, wow, best decision. I didn't know it could be like this. God's going to knock your socks off. You're going to be so blessed. All right? It all starts with a couple of weeks with an SPT. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.